Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our monthly mortgage market playbook. This month, we have a very exciting guest with us and a topic that we, you know, we all could learn consistently about the appraisal process. So we're going to dive a little deep into the what the appraiser looks for, how the behind the scenes of an appraisal and how appraisal is written. We have a special guest that is named Hugh Jean. Uh, he's with my company, but before I get to him, I just want to introduce myself and my team. I'm Dave Flasher. For those who doesn't know, I'm the regional vice president of Stockton Mortgage, also run the branch here in Georgia. For those who have worked with me, you know my team, Beth Martell and Suzette White. That's my right hand and my left hand. If you've ever done a transaction with me, you know who they are. In addition to Beth and Suzette, we have Amber Jervis. Amber is the marketing director for my office. If you work with me or anyone on this call who, who invited you and you need some marketing help, just email your loan officer and maybe we can get Amber to assist you if there's some co-branding that you want or flyers or anything marketing related. You know, we're here to help as well. Before we get started, let me introduce you to Eugene. If at any time you guys have any questions or you want to just chime in, put it in the chat box. We'll get to it. This is super informal. This is open for everyone to have chats. And just so put it in the chat box. We'll check it and we'll ask Eugene or myself that question. We'll get all of your questions answered by the end. And at the end, if you just want to have an open forum and, you know, live Q&A, let's do it. We don't mind. We want you to be more informed. Uh, so now the guest speaker, Eugene Antonelli, not only a colleague of mine, but he's a very good friend of mine. We've been friends and colleagues for a very long time. And the guy is just an encyclopedia of knowledge when it comes to mortgages. He's been in the mortgage business for over 20 years. He's started out as a loan officer, then went into management. He's done sales. He's done ops. He's done underwriting, business development. He was an underwriter for eight years. Also dabbled in real estate. I don't know why anybody would hire him to drive. He, why would anyone want to drive around Eugene for a couple hours? But, you know, he's pretty successful at that as well. But he's got more kids than Cody. He's got four beautiful children and a wife that is an absolute saint. With, all, with further ado, Eugene Antonelli. Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, thank you for uh, taking time to jump on with us today. And uh, I'm going to give you guys some insights um, you may know, you may not know about in regards to the appraisal process. So going to kick it off with just internal appraisal management versus third party management AMC. So here at Stockton Mortgage, we utilize an internal appraisal management system. And, and all that means is that we manage the appraisers ourselves. So we go out and we have the ability to add appraisers, build branch panels, and they utilize our software for the order requests that come through. If you've heard in the past, if you've spoken to loan officers in the past and they said, well, I'm waiting on the AMC or, you know, let me check in with the AMC, the status of this appraisal, then they're using a third-party management system, AMC. What we don't like about that process, you know, they both have their pros and cons. In the AMC world, you know, we just don't not having the full control. You don't necessarily always see who the appraiser is. You don't get to be the one to communicate directly with the appraiser. You're going through this third party as a, as a middleman between you and the appraiser. In addition to that, in our system, the appraiser play, pays a $60 fee for the software utilization and for some of the, the tools that we utilize, but they keep the rest of the appraisal fee. So if appraisal is $600, then they're getting $540 every time they do a request. With the management company, they're taking anywhere from 25 to 50% of the appraisal fee, depending on the management company. Why we find that to be a little bit of a con, you know, you know, obviously when the appraisers are getting paid more money, they tend to be more responsive. They tend to, you know, produce more quality reports. They're not having to bang through, you know, a lot more reports just to get to the income level that they want to get to. So we utilize this internal management appraisal management system. It allows us to build the branches, individual panels, and customize it around each individual market. So before we go to the next slide where we're going to talk about data, collection of data, the agency's collection of data, just curious if anybody knows how long the agency, so both Fannie and Freddie have been collecting data from appraisals and FHA has also been collecting data. Does anybody know, just drop in the chat if you know how long they have been collecting appraisal data on appraisal reports?
Who so wants to guess? Any guesses? I say 20 plus years. 20 plus. All right, we can flip to the next slide. So we're going to talk about the data collection that is being utilized. So the fun fact at the bottom there, data collection began in 2011 for Fannie and Freddie, and then in 2016 for FHA loans. So oh, what yeah. is this data? Yeah, it's it's been they're 12 years for the agencies. So what is this data they're collecting? So every appraisal report, no matter what bank you go to, no matter what lender you use, if you're getting a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac loan, it is pulling and extracting the data from that report and it's putting it into a UCDP system. The data that it's collecting is information about the subject property as reported by the appraiser, the square footage, you know, the condition, all of this different information, but it's also collecting the data from the comparables that they use. So when they put the report together, they're using the subject property and then they're getting comparable properties from the neighborhood to determine ultimately what the value is going to be. When those reports reports come in, they are, the data is extracted and it's put into the UCDP. It then takes that information and it scores the quality of that appraisal report. Now, again, the, every lender, anybody who's getting a conventional mortgage, their information is going into the system. And then no matter whose mortgage or what mortgage company did that loan, we then put our information and it then scrubs against all of the other companies. So it's not just appraisal reports from our company, it's appraisal reports for anybody obtaining a conventional mortgage. So what it does is it then begins to cross-reference the information that was put in. So let's say the comparable used 123 Main Street was used on our report. Um, it'll then say, you know, uh, your appraiser utilized 123, or your, yeah, your appraiser utilized 123 Main Street. And they listed the 123 Main Street at 2,000 square feet, but we have another appraiser who did another report on another property who also used the sale at 123 Main Street, and they've got it measured out at 1,864 square feet. So depending on the differences, it may flag that. We get what's called an SSR report that gives us the information of what kind of data issues we should be paying attention to. So it will say, double check with the appraiser, uh, eight, you know, 123 Main Street, according to uh, appraiser B, is only 1,800 square feet. You have it at 2,000. A lot of times you'll get a little bit of a difference because appraisers don't have to measure the homes exactly the same. So they have the option of measuring from the exterior or from the interior. As you can imagine, if the appraiser measures from the exterior, they're going to come up with a little bit more square footage as they're not coming inside inside the drywall. They're not coming inside the home. They're probably getting an extra you know, eight to nine inches every foot around the exterior. So a little bit of a difference is typical and you're going to see it. Um, you then will also have appraisers who utilize public records when they're cross-referencing the comparables. A lot of times public records, if you've put an addition on, if you've renovated and, and added some space, or if you've turned, you know, turned in an exterior space and enclosed it and turned it into an interior space that now makes it part of the gross living area, it's not necessarily updated in the public records. So if an appraiser just pulls public record information and doesn't do the research on possibly pulling in the lost listings or something of that nature, then they will be off in square footage. When this report kicks out a when the data report comes out it kicks out potential red flags it also scores the appraisal report so it gives it a score on on Fannie and Freddie from one to five one being the highest of quality five being not so great quality and it's basing that simply based upon the data that it's extracting out of the the appraisal report when it comes in so what we do with those numbers um, are if it's a 2.5 or less, then Fannie or Freddie say you've got a quality report. If your score is a 2.5 or less, go ahead. You know We're good to go on this one. We like it um, because we trust the data that we have in our system. And a 2.5 or less, 
we're going to say you've got a good appraisal there. Over a 2.5 and up to a 5, you have to start doing some additional legwork. So if you guys have ever had a call from one of our one of our team members saying, hey, we've got a little bit higher score on this one. We've got to do some additional due diligence. This is where all of that information is coming from. So in, in this case, depending on how high that score goes, it can be anything from just going back to the appraiser and, and asking them to uh, clarify, you know, what information did you utilize to, to come up with the measurements for this? Where did you get the measurements for the square footage on this? Or, you know, it could be the comp one, sold for 245,000 yet another appraiser reported that sale at 237,000 what data source did you use to come up with the sales price that you did for comp number 3 if the score goes high enough if we start getting into the the mid fours closer to 5 that may require a field review a desk review a desk review a second appraisal you know, depending on the quality of that report. So if anytime a lender is reaching out to you, I promise nobody's doing these things for fun. Nobody wants to do a second appraisal. Nobody wants to do a desk review or a field review, but we have to because we're, we're working within the guidelines of the agencies who ultimately are the ones that are going to, you know, tell us whether or not they like the appraisal report or they don't like the appraisal report. Stockton Mortgage is agency direct lender. So we deal mostly with Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. So we're not looking at a whole lot of investor overlays or pushback from investors. This is directly to the agency that, that we're having these communications. So what happens so, in my, go ahead. So Gina, this, so this is not a Stockton thing. This is anyone who's writing loans and, and orders an appraisal has to follow this SSR and the UCDP. Is that correct? Yeah, anybody who's doing a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan or an FHA loan, FHA has their own portal, so they don't use the UCDP, they use the EAD. So theirs is a little bit more, I would imagine sometime in the next few years, they may come out with more of a scoring system, but I think they're, you know, they're really... They're all under the federal government, but they're really under the federal government. So I think they're a little bit behind on, on what they're doing. And, and I would be okay if they don't come out with a scoring system because it, it really has changed the dynamics of the world that we live in. And, and we're starting to see more of it now. So the last few years, you may not have seen a ton of this really because there were so many loans that were going on. So many, you know, you guys were making offers with you know, we don't even care what the appraisal comes in. We're going to come up with the cash. We're, we're waiving the appraisal. We're waiving the mortgage. We're waiving the home inspection. It was just a different world the last couple of years. And from the lender's perspective, to some degree, we we also lived in that world with you guys. Oh, this one's ten thousand dollars short. Who cares? They've got a thirty thousand dollar appraisal guarantee. Let's just move it. Let's just keep it moving. The market was moving so fast that it was almost it was hard for appraisals to to keep up. The house could be selling for five hundred thousand today, and then four days later before. Before that one even closes, the neighbor's house just went for five hundred twenty-five thousand, and two weeks later, the other neighbor's house just went for five forty, and none of them have closed. So we don't even have the data on a lot of that. You're probably seeing more of this. If you are seeing any of this, you're probably seeing it more as the last twelve months than you had probably seen prior. And that's really a combination of the agencies really doing their due diligence. They've really stepped up their review game. I don't know how many additional reviewers Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac hired, but they've definitely hired a significant number and, and they're going through appraisals right now looking for quality. In the past, we probably wouldn't see, in the past, we probably wouldn't see a, a quality review unless it was triggered by something, usually a, a late pay by the borrower or a slow pay by the borrower. If the agency starts seeing those types of things, they'll often do a, a quality review of that loan to see if, that it's a good loan because because at the end of the day, we sell these loans to to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and then we service them. You know, they ultimately end up with these mortgages, and you know, they they want to make sure they've got quality loans. And when someone makes a slow pay, they have the ability to go in and, and double check our work at that point in time, or at any time. But it was usually triggered by something, so they can go in and double check our our work. And I probably get we're probably getting about to a week now essentially it's an email from fannie mae or freddie mac um just says hey dear stockton mortgage um, we've done a quality review of 123 main street we have the below uh below findings we need you to respond to this by october 15th if your response is not does not is not suitable for us or we don't like your response we will have you uh, send us four hundred thirty six thousand dollars by october the 28th and you will now own this loan that 
that's the gist of how it works with them. That's essentially the entire email that they send. So when we get those, we then have to dive in, take a look at it. You know, what was the score? Most of the times the score was a 3.8 or higher. And it's got, you know, maybe some comps that are further away. It, it has some red flags that we need to see how we address them. And sometimes we have addressed them in to what we thought was sufficient. And sometimes, sometimes we're not, you know, we didn't. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we thought. It's what Fannie Mae thought. So I've been on these calls with somebody in Podunk, Texas, who's a reviewer who's never left their county looking at an appraisal in Loganville and telling us that this appraiser shouldn't have used this comp. It's it's a little bit frustrating. You know, it's frustrating to us. It, you know, if you guys have been involved in any of this, or if you have friends who are appraisers who have been involved with, you know, if, if it's frustrating to us, it's really frustrating to them because appraisers require quite a bit of education and on-the-job training before they can even become appraisers. Most of these appraisers have years of experience. And they've got some guy or gal sitting in an office somewhere telling them that they don't understand their market and that they could have done a better job. This is where a lot of that information comes from. And it's continuing, you know, it's continued to be used on a regular basis. You know, let's dive into that a little bit more. So the SSR score comes up after we run this program, this appraisal through a software system and it spits out a score of one through five. So mm -hmm. we have an appraisal that has been completed by a third party vendor, right? We have a $300,000 sales price with a $300,000 value. There's no repairs needed, okay? To everyone outside of the SSR, the underwriter and Fannie Mae, agents say, yay, we've got buyers and sellers that say we're good, but we say, hey, pump the brakes. We got a CU score, which is the one through five, of anything higher than a 3.8 or a 4, this appraisal's not good. We can't use it, right? So we have to explain this to the real estate agent and the buyers and sellers. We have a good report. There's no repairs needed. But guess what? We can't use this report because Fannie Mae does not like the report. Right. Can you dive in a little bit and explain that to all the agents on the call of why we can't use that report that a third party vendor has stamped because we use this appraisal so heavily in the process. We trust this appraiser to go find the comps, use the value, but we don't like his, Fannie Mae doesn't like the work. Can you explain a little bit? Yeah, the biggest thing is, I guess, you know, we're using the term can't use it. It's really a risk analysis and whether or not we want to use it. So if Fannie doesn't say we we ha we can't not use it. They just say, if we don't like it, you're going to own this loan. And they don't really provide guidance to, you know, when they're going to make you buy back a loan and when they're not going to make you buy back a loan. And the other challenge to the buybacking of a loan is depending on how you pull your loans and sell them to, to Fannie Mae. So some companies do a one-to-one. -one, so they'll sell just the loan to the agency. And some companies do it in bulk. If they don't like one appraisal on one loan, you don't just buy back that loan. You're buying back that entire pool of loans. So it could be 10 loans that you're buying back. So it, it, it's really a risk analysis. And when you get that score, when it's high like that, it, it's likely going to get triggered by Fannie. So what we have to do is really be able to have the data to support that even though the score is high, this is still a quality report. The challenge that we sometimes run into, and, we, and Dave, you know, we've done a few with you guys, your team, you know, we had one a couple months ago, the, the, remember the one where the, this was a $900,000 sale. The home appraised for over 900000 The home was, it was an immaculate home. The, the, the people had put so much money into this home that the appraisers really had to stretch to find the value. And this home was in a neighborhood where I think the highest sale this was a it was a nine hundred thousand dollars sale, and the highest sale in that neighborhood was like six hundred and seventy five thousand dollars. So this was just the absolute largest house in the neighborhood. Um, I think the pool and the finished walkout basement they had to have spent four hundred thousand dollars on. And this was a twenty. 23 or 2400 square foot walkout basement to an in-ground pool to a pool house they've spent a lot and we were only giving them $75,000 for 
this pool and pool house, which was a very reasonable amount. I guarantee they spent 250 grand just on the pool and the pool house itself, not even. And I think we gave them 60,000 for the finished basement, which was probably another $200,000 that they put into this basement. We're all sitting around going, this home is worth $900,000. The appraiser says it's worth $900,000. The challenge was when you looked at the CU scores, it scored at a five. It wanted the appraiser to address this house was at 123 Main Street. Why did the appraiser not use 127 Main Street right across the street? Home sold for you know $585,000. Why did the appraiser not use this? And we could explain to ourselves on why the appraiser didn't use it. It was a smaller home. It didn't have the pool. It didn't have the, the pool house. It didn't have a finished walkout basement. You know, but the appraiser had to go down the road to find homes that had these same amenities and that wasn't going to work. So we were able to work through that. I know we ended up cleaning up the report. I think they ended up coming down a little bit on their sales price, but we had to work through it. But the, the challenge is that if, it, if the score gets that high, it's got to be a quality report or else you're going to own that loan. And there aren't many companies out there saying, we don't care. We're going to go ahead and own the loan. We try to get it as close to being as, as flexible as we can. Our CEO is a let's make deals happen mentality. He's not here to say no. He's here to say yes, but also has to make sure that we're we're all still here six months from now, 12 months from now. And we didn't go out of business because we had to buy back a bunch of loans. Is there anyone on this call real estate wise? Okay. I know my loan officers do. call. Do you understand what a buyback is, a mortgage buyback? If you do not, put it in the chat box and we'll explain to you what it is and how it factors in to these appraisers, appraisals and these scores. Does anyone not understand what that means? All right, so we got, if there's one person, good. So what happens is this, we service loans on behalf of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, okay? We write loans based off of their guidelines, okay? Even though we service it, if the, the mortgage defaults, Fannie and Freddie will take it from us and then resell it as a foreclosure, right? But we still have to write the loan based off of their guidelines, okay? Now, post-closing, they can come back and do an audit at any time and say, hey, and this can this is a month, a year, two years down the road. They can do an audit on loans and say, we don't like this loan because you wrote this loan and you were out of compliance. You were out of underwriting. Why did you write this loan? If we as a lender, when I say we, this is all lenders, okay? If we as a lender say we made a mistake and we shouldn't have, and we can't rectify it, we have to buy that back from Fannie because it's no longer, they no longer want that loan on their books because it doesn't fit their guidelines, okay? So we have to buy that loan back from them. Now that goes on our, goes at profit and loss from the company. There's some companies only have warehouse lines. They got to use that warehouse line to buy that and end up paying interest on that, okay? For us, since we service loans, we use our money, we sell it to Fannie Mae, replenishes our money, and then we service it on behalf of Fannie Mae. If there's a buyback, we have to buy that back in whole from the from Fannie Mae and use the company's money. Now, some of these loans are 300000 to 500,000, 700,000. If that happens, the company has to stroke a check for whatever's left on that loan. That's a buyback, so we'll take that loan back, okay? So now, how it factors into this SSR and these CU scores. Let's use that one, for example, that Eugene just said that was the most overvalued home, over improved home in the subdivision. This was a $600,000 home that the family that lived in there put excessive upgrades in, right? I would love to live in that home. I think they have an archery set or a, an it was like an archery thing in the backyard. It was amazing. It looked like a resort, right? But just because you put 100,000 into the backyard doesn't mean you're going to get 100,000 in value. We all know that, right? So in this case, it was so overvalued that the appraiser needed to go outside the subdivision to pull the comps, okay? We had an above value we had no repairs. This was a great deal, okay? But we told the agents, hey, we can't use this appraisal because it's not passing compliance. We could, as a company, wrote the loan. Fannie Mae, six months down the road, could have said, hey, we told you we didn't like this score, 
buy that back from us at 800,000. We don't want this loan anymore. That's bad news for a company when that happens. Yeah. That's how important these scores are, right? That we have to oblige by their rules, or they'll make sure that we buy it, or, the, the, or we have to buy it back because they don't want it on their paper. They don't want it on their books. So we have to go with these scores to determine the how valid that report is, right? The first thing Eugene said earlier is, how long has been they been collecting data? Fannie Mae knows the data from every comp and every purchase that's been sold since 2011. They know what comps they want to see. They can't tell the appraiser what comps to use, but they can ask why they didn't use them. Go ahead, Eugene. Thank you. Yeah, and, and if they don't like the answers, and then the, on that buyback, you know, so just to give you one more piece of that buyback. So most companies have cash; they, they're required to have cash. You can't be a lender today that's directly to the agency and not have a, a net worth and amount of cash on hand. Or else they won't let you be the direct lender. You've got to go through a third party. But once you do spend your own cash, a lot of companies don't have enough cash to just leave that loan on their books and just show it as an asset going forward because they need that cash for other things. So so then you have to sell it on the scratch and dent market, which usually pays somewhere between. So if you had a if you had a hundred thousand dollar loan, the scratch and dent market to get that off of your books to get you know as much cash as you can, they're probably going to give you depending on what it is. If it was just all oh, the Fannie didn't like the score, you might get. 85 cents on the dollar. So they might give you $85,000. They now own that loan. You no longer own that loan. And you've got 85 of your 100. You lost $15,000. Um, but if it was you know, some other type of a significant appraisal issue or an income issue or something that basically the borrower wasn't qualified, you might only get 50 cents on it. So you may lose 50 mm. grand on that deal. And, and just that's a show, real thing, guys. There's actually something <clears throat> called a scratch and dent market. That's the real terminology for that. That's it. And and the way the the one that we were talking about where it was so over improved, like I said, it, I would have paid nine hundred thousand dollars for that house, you know, every day of the week because it was just it was worth every penny of it. But the funny thing about that, if you remember, there was a listing agent involved in that who really wasn't understanding it. And if you remember, they went to take the borrower and, and bring the borrower over to their lender, which by all means, you know, in that situation, you know, we're going to do right by the borrower. If the borrower can get this loan, they, this was their dream house, we're going to do everything we can to help them get into that home, whether that means closing their loan with us or helping them close it somewhere else. But the agent came back after the weekend and ultimately said, no, let's just go with you guys. And and though it made it seem like it was because they just wanted to get the deal done and whatnot, I, what I know really happened was they sent that off to their other lender, let their lender look at it. And they had the same mindset of, we have a five on this report. There's nothing. We're, we're not taking this deal. We're not going to take this transferred appraisal from you guys with a five on it. We're just not going to do it because it's, it's not worth the risk. And that just shows it's a pretty level playing field when it comes to the scoring and, and how the scores come in. Everybody's getting the same scores. Everybody's looking at the same math and, and, and trying to take on a similar amount of risk. Before we jump to the next screen, we'll do another fun fact of Put in the chat box what you think the average age of an appraiser is. Mm, good question. Got a few. 38, 52, 50, 45, 36. It's like Price is Right. Oh, we got 57. Seven. Someone went above me. 61 for Lauren. Ready to flip over? Yeah, go ahead. So the average age of an appraiser is 49, and this is down six years. Melissa wins. I think it's a combination of there are some newer folks getting into the appraiser side of the market, but there's also, I get probably... I probably get the one to two a week emails, especially the last 12 months from appraisers saying, hey, just letting you guys know I've decided to retire. Go ahead and take me off your list. So I think the last couple of years, these appraisers, they were working hard and earning a lifetime's amount of money that depending on how they were, how much work they were willing to put in, they could have an unlimited number of deals to, to work on for the 21 and 22 or 2021 and part of 22. So a lot of them have said, you know what, it's time to pack up and sell my house for more than I ever thought I could get for it and move south or move north or get out of the game. That is, that's down a little bit. It was 50, it was 55 going into 2022. 
So let's talk about some some changes, some things that you guys may have heard, some things that you might have seen that's going on in the in the appraisal space. So last year, Fannie introduced the desktop appraisals. This was basically the appraiser could do all the work from their desktop. The, the, the thought process with that was that it was going to reduce costs. It was going to uh, increase turn times or uh, decrease turn times, and it was going to make things smoother from the world that we were living in, where some cases, depending on where you lived, you were either paying a, a ridiculous fee for an appraisal or you were going to be waiting a, a, a considerable amount of time to get an appraisal back. So it was a combination of either paying through the nose or, or, or sitting around and, and waiting for that appraisal to come back in, in 2021 and, and heading into the part of 2022. So this desktop appraisal was supposed to solve the world's problems. The challenge with it is when a loan is run through what we call automated underwriting systems. So Fannie Mae has a desktop underwriter and the Freddie Mac has LP. So when it gets run through it, the system, this will approve the loan or deny the loan. It'll also tell you what things you need for from the borrower for income and, and assets. Then it also addresses the property itself. So it can give you, you know, you need a full appraisal on this. It might spit out. You don't need an appraisal at all. We've got enough data and, and we think this value is good. We're going to actually issue a property inspection waiver. You don't even need to have an appraisal on this home. Or it might tell you you need a desktop appraisal. So if you get that, you could utilize the desktop appraisal. The challenge with that was the requirements of the appraiser, they still have to provide things that they won't be able to get unless they use a third party service or if they spend their time and energy searching and digging for it. So like in a desktop appraisal, you still have to have interior photos of the home. So imagine the appraiser sitting at their desk going, I still have to get interior photos of this home. So they're having to scour the internet. They're looking at the listing. There's third-party services that they can utilize that kind of puts it in one centralized location. But at the end of the day, in their minds, they're going, I'd rather just drive to the home and take these photos myself and call it a day. So the cost never really came down because the appraisers were spending just as much time on a full appraisal as a desktop appraisal, and they were still having to utilize <clears throat> additional resources to get information that they could just get themselves by going and visiting the home. So that never really, we do them. If we get them, we, we have the ability to do them. I know we've done a handful of them, but since the costs were no cheaper, the turn times were no faster, we tend to still just get full appraisals. They introduced this ANSI measuring requirements. So after looking at the data for the past 10 years, they decided that they needed to have a uniform measuring system. So they use ANSI, which ANSI has been around for years and most appraisers were already using it, but it did change some of the things. Like, so if you guys have ever come across ANSI, if you, I don't know, depending on where you're at in Georgia, you might see some homes like, so in the ANSI measuring system, for example, if 50% of the room has a ceiling height below seven feet, that is not, that square footage is not included in the the gross living area. You still get value for it, but it's done as a separate value on the appraisal report. So if the home is 2,000 square feet, you think it's 2,000 square feet, but it's got an upstairs that only has a six and a half foot ceiling because it's a bungalow style home or something like that. And it's got an eight foot ceiling down the center, but then the sides angle and it, the 50% of the room is not over seven feet. It could come back as a 1,600 square foot home, but then they'll have a 400 square foot adjustment and give it some more value. But the ANSI measuring requirements just requires everybody to measure, you know, areas the same way to, to try to cut down on some of the, hey, appraiser A measured 123 Main Street at 2,000 square feet, but appraiser B measured it at 2246, but they both went to the same home. They both measured and came up with different numbers. So that was out. It hasn't really affected things. It didn't really have any kind of a negative or positive effect. It just really clarified how the appraiser should be measuring things. There are some efforts to modernize appraisers. So they're coming out with some hybrid appraisal reports where the system might say, you know what, we like this up, we like this value, but we want to know what condition the property is in. So you got to get property condition reports. Again, this is a method they're trying to utilize to to try to streamline the appraisal process. If you talk to appraisers, you know, it's talking to loan officers in the early 2000s. I started my career at uh, Quicket Loans or Rocket Mortgage. So at that time, it was like 
the relationship based loan officers are going to be gone in the next two years and everything's going to be done by a computer system. And I, I think in the real estate space, you guys are probably seeing some of that with some of the things that they're trying to do, the zills of the worlds and, and things, you know, don't hire an agent, just utilize our services where you feel like people are trying to get rid of your job or reduce your influence or your, your role in the real estate transaction itself. I think appraisers are feeling that today. There's all these efforts to utilize systems as opposed to actual appraisers. And we're just not seeing it because the efforts that they're putting out there, the agencies are not are not something that lenders want to take the risk on. For an example, in that property condition report, they still have to give you data from the square footage. They've got to give you, they've got to take exterior photos. There's things that they, they have to do, but if the company doesn't do it correctly, then Fannie Mae can still come back to us and say, your property, we, we drove by the property and your property condition report uh, doesn't match what we believe we found and we want you to buy this loan back. So there's a lot of efforts right now to streamline the appraisal process, a lot of which stemmed from the last couple of years when appraisal turn times were getting excessive or the appraisal fees were, were going up. But now that things have more stabilized, we're in a different environment, a lot of that push has quieted and appraisers aren't feeling like they're going to be out of business and have no jobs in the next few years that there's still going to be a use for them. Any questions about things that you're hearing, things that you're seeing, things that, you know, maybe we've come to you and and tried to explain or that, you know, other companies you've worked with have come to you that you just didn't quite understand what they were trying to tell you, but ultimately they couldn't get a loan done, but the reasoning didn't make sense to you? I got a few questions that they reached that some of these real estate agents, realtors reached out to me beforehand. So I'm just going to on their behalf. Biggest question in the that we receive as a loan officer always comes from the agent. Does this home pass FHA or conventional, right? So what is an appraiser looking for when a house is not 100%, okay, on an FHA versus a conventional, okay? Yeah. Let, let's start there. So, you know, it, the thing with appraisals and, and with what we're dealing with every day is you have to look back, you know, 15 years ago, which it is it's not that long ago. So the market crash, big debacle, the real estate, you know, bust, uh, 2008, 2009, 2010, still weighs heavily on, you know, mortgage lenders' minds because of all of, you know, the scrutiny that we got. But you have to remember in the appraisal world, you know, the appraisers also took a pretty big hit on that. And the appraisers' lives were changed drastically from that from a result of that crash because there was a lot of fraud there was a lot of there were a lot of bad apples if you just google fraudulent appraisal cases from 2008 2009 2010 you're going to find a slew of them there's people serving prison time still today from things and it, it wasn't the majority it was definitely a minority of people but it required a lot of so i don't know if you guys know this but appraisers have to carry a million dollar insurance so they have to carry a policy of i think it's a minimum of 500,000, but most of them, the amount of business they do have to carry a million. Loan officers also have to carry an insurance policy. Either, you're, you, either you personally have to, or your company has to carry one on your behalf that basically says, if you don't do your job to the best of your ability, somebody's going to get paid from your insurance policy. Appraisers have to carry these policies, and if they do a bad report, they could have to pay that out. So the reason I say that is, is when you're talking about conventional and FHA, essentially FHA is going to look more at the health and safety aspect of it. They're going to be looking for things that could be a health factor, something that, that could be a safety issue, whereas conventional is going to look at more, it, is everything that we need here? Is it here and is it it's supposed to be here? Is it actually here? Is it normal wear and tear? Is this uh, something that the borrowers can still utilize and live in this home? The reason I talk about the appraisers and, and their concerns is many of you may have had in your experience, you might, you know, we, I had, I had one just yesterday. I got a as is appraisal report at value, comes in at value and the appraisal is as is. But the appraiser then took 17 photos of things they didn't like within the home. So they took a photo of a loose handrail and they put loose handrail. 
you're not telling us that it's subject to it, it's as is, but they took a photo of a there was a, looks like they patched some drywall. So this was a conventional loan. So it's an as an appraisal. It's conventional. They took a picture of patched appraisal or patched drywall work. So it hadn't been it had been sanded, but it hadn't been primed and painted. And they just put a photo. It just said patched drywall work. And I think there were seven photos total. It wasn't quite as many, but it was seven photos total of things that they found. So us as a lender now has to look at that and decide whether or not that's going to be an issue from a quality review standpoint when it gets to Fannie Mae. Me personally, I to pick up the phone and call these folks and say, why did you put that photo in there? And really, it's just to cover their own rear ends. That's at the end of the day, that's what they're trying to make sure they do. And then they just kick the can down the road and make us decide. When it comes to those two different things, you know, FHA is going to be sticklers on on the health and safety. They've got handrail requirements. They've got if the home was built prior to 1978 and you've got peeling paint because of lead-based paint at that time, you've got to paint and scrape that lead-based paint off. You've got to get your water tested. Whereas if you have a well, you're going to be testing some water. You're going to be doing things that you're not doing on a conventional loan, but ultimately we're still relying on what the appraiser puts in the appraisal report and whether or not they're requiring those repairs or if they're just making notes of those repairs and whether or not we're going to require them. Basements. How? What you're is muted. considered? Can we use the basement and the square footage? You're still muted. I am. I am not. Can you hear me now? I can hear Dave. Yeah. Gene, Gino, can you hear me? Gino, can you hear me? There you go. All right. All right. That's weird. So, That's okay. okay. Next question we have is about basements, right? You know, number one, at what point can we consider a, a bedroom in the basement? part of the value okay what does a basement need to have to determine like windows doors closet let's dive a little into the basement aspect of a house and how it affects the appraised value so when you're looking at bedrooms and things in the basement they're never going to count them as like a three-bedroom home never going to call it a four-bedroom home so when you're looking at a gridded out appraisal report it's going to have a section for the upper level and it's going to have a section for the lower level. So if you've got a five bedroom house, because in your eyes, two bedrooms are in the basement, it has, it has to have an an escape. It's an egress window and a way to escape. You know, it could be a walkout basement. Those are considered bedrooms, but they're on an appraisal report. There's going to be listed as a three bedroom home because that's the home, the bedrooms are upstairs. And then it's going to have a separate bracket. That's going to say lower level. And then it's going to give you all the value for for those things. If it's below grade, it's not going to be considered part of the gross living area. It's going to be adjusted as part of a lower level square footage. And in that regards, even if you didn't have the full on walkout or an egress window, when they go to do the adjustments, if there's a room down there, then they would just call it. You have two extra rooms, you have a bathroom, you have a, a living space, and they'll give you the value for that, but they're never going to take it and say, okay, this is a three bedroom home, but two lower square bedrooms. Let's go compare this to five bedroom listed homes because those homes actually have five bedrooms that are above, above square, above the grade, grade level. Great answer. Great question. Let's talk about utilities. Here's a question like we get quite often. Do utilities need to be on, on a conventional loan versus utilities need to be on for a government loan. And guys, when I say government, that's USDA, VA, and FHA. So let's talk about the difference between utilities on or off on those two different loan programs. So in in the government loans, they do need to be on. We're gonna require that they're on and evidence of them. In the conventional world, you actually don't have to have them on. The appraiser should be able to make a determination that there's no, they don't, you know, if they're not on and the appraiser sees that there's a, a busted pipe, then they're going to note that there's an issue here. So they have to make a extraordinary circumstance that that it is, you know, that they're active and that they'll work when they are turned on. So they don't necessarily have to be on for a conventional loan. Okay. Yeah. Great, great question. Thank you. So utilities on for, on for government does not need to be on for conventional. And guys, this is just from experience. 
If there is a crawl space and it's locked, it needs to be unlocked when the appraiser gets there because the appraiser needs, to, even if it's on your belly type of crawl space, the appraiser doesn't know that. So if the appraiser goes out there and it's locked, they're going to make that 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 report subject to because they want to put their eyes on that crawl space to see what's in there. And that would cost another anywhere from $125 to $150 just for the appraiser just to go back out. If there is a lock on any door, make sure it's unlocked before that appraiser gets there. Um, Laura has a great question. Um, that in the chat box, Gino? Yeah. That's what I said. Determine the crawl space. Yeah, so this is one that uh, this is one that doesn't have a black and white guidance to, and it, it's probably one of the ones that I struggle the most with. What I'm so I deal with it. I think for those of you guys, if we didn't talk about on this, I handle most of the the escalated conversations with appraisers. I'd like to think I have a special skill for it. I think I developed it back when I was a loan officer, having to talk to to underwriters and always looking for a way to, to get to essentially get my way without telling them they're wrong and they're, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. So you had to develop a, a conversation pattern with them to get them to see your way and give you what you need without making them feel like you're telling them they don't know what they're doing. So you're, I do you're that. You're married with four kids. That you've <laughs> determined you got that trait from that. So I talked to a lot of these appraisers and the challenge that I run into is that essentially th there's no right or wrong answer to this. The answer is the appraiser makes the determination based upon, you know, they have to apply it even. So they, they, they have a, a little bit of guidance. It's going to give them a range of what they can utilize, um, but they've got to support it in the appraisal and they've got to use it consistently. The challenge. So I had one last week, the appraiser, I don't think she's my friend anymore. I'm not getting a Christmas card from her. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that. So her rule last week on this appraisal report was if the home, if the comparable is within 100 square feet. So if the square footage of the comp and the square footage of the subject property are within 100 square feet, she does not make an adjustment for square footage. The problem I had with that was the, this particular house was 2,200 square feet. The comparables, there were fi five comparables. Three of them were 100 square feet or more larger. So they were over 100 square feet larger. And two of them were, one was 87 square feet and one was 92 square feet smaller. So the 87 square foot home smaller, the 92 square foot home smaller she made no adjustments for now these would have been positive adjustments in the appraisal report this would have brought the value up for the those comps and then of course she made a negative adjustment for the three other comps that were all larger than the home and i disagreed with this because of course the ones that were 87 and 92 square feet smaller sold for less money significantly less money than than our subject and the ones that were over 100 square foot larger sold for much more than our subject but she adjusted all of those down so i didn't agree with having a fictitious 100 square foot there's no rule for this. It's just her personal preference and she applies it in all her reports and that's how she justifies it to herself. But to me, it was a disservice to the borrower. And we went round and she just didn't see or understand what I was talking about. Ultimately, she finally decided to put it into her appraiser network chat group and get some feedback. And we did get her to make an adjustment when it was all said and done based on the responses from her colleagues. A scenario like that was very difficult, especially when we talk about the fact that, you know, you can measure from the interior or the exterior. So in this scenario, not only did she, she also measured the home from the interior. So if she would have measured it from the exterior, now we would have been over 100 square feet larger than those two smaller sales. Now she's making a positive adjustment. Now we're hitting our sales price without any issues. There really isn't a, a, a requirement to what they utilize. There's a range based upon the the luxury items or lack of luxury items that it has, but it has to be applied consistently. My biggest challenge when it comes to the appraisers is sometimes I feel like 
they've appraised the home in their minds before they've actually stepped foot in it. And that creates a little bit of a challenge for us. I've been working in this neighborhood for 70, especially the last two years. You know, some of these appraisers, the average age is 55 years old. Some of these guys and gals have been doing it for 30 years. I had one last year. I think the appraiser said, I've lived here for 40 years and a home in, in Gulf Side Ridge has never sold over $400,000. They are now. They're selling for over $400,000, so you're going to just have to adopt that. Going all the way back to the first slide that we did, that's when we liked having the appraisal management system where we manage it because I can't take an appraiser off of our panel just because they brought a value in low. That would be out of compliance for us. But I can take an appraiser off if I feel like they're not being justified in, in, in their quality of work. And, and it's not because they're not bringing a value in it, what I want them to bring the value in it. It's because they're not using reasonable or, or a reasonable mindset to apply it to how they're determining the value. And in that regards, I can take them off of our list and, and, and not utilize them again. If they, I think someone from your team, Dave, may have been, or maybe not your team, but somebody had an experience where the appraiser, where the appraiser, was extremely rude. And, and when I talked to her, she said she absolutely was because she felt like they were questioning her ability to do her job. And it's, okay, you're no longer on the list because you're still, a, though you don't work for Stockton Mortgage, you still represent us. You still represent our agents, our referral partners, and we can't have you speaking to people. At that point, you've got to be able to to, to take the high road and, and just deal with the consumer. You're in a customer service-based kind of an industry. You know, Going all the way back to that slide, we do have the ability to determine which appraisers we are going to use and not use. It just can't be based upon the value that, that they brought in the home. Good stuff. Thank you. Hey, it's past 11. We always like to keep this about an hour. Does anybody have any other follow-up questions? And if you do afterwards, you could just email me or your loan officer and we'll get you those answers. You know, if we don't know the question, because there's a lot of them, we're going to get you, we're going to reach out to Eugene or maybe an appraiser. So question was, can you talk to the appraisers? As a loan officer, the answer is yes, we can call the appraiser. We just can't steer, we can't tell them what we want as value, right? We can question them and say, listen, I see that you used comps one, two, and three. How come we use those comps? I just, we just can't tell them what value we want and what we need, okay? But we can have a, no, a business conversation with them and say, listen, when you go out there, go speak to B Brooks because she's awesome and she's gonna give you access. Or by the way, before you go out there, there is a crawl space on the Charlie side of the property just to let you know. So we can speak to the appraisers. We know who the appraiser is and their contact information as they accept the order. We just can't steer them to what we want, right? So then, as an agent, you can. So agents can talk to appraisers as well. I always tell the agents if you have a conversation, however, I would not get to a point where you're having an escalated conversation. So that same one that I disagreed with the appraiser on and the, that same exact deal, the agent had called the appraiser first. And to be honest, I think that was more of why she was not wanting to cooperate. I think I think she had to let cooler heads prevail. I think she was so upset that the agent called her and told her she didn't know what she was doing and these types of things. They had a not great conversation. And then here I come along and I essentially am agreeing with the agent, though the agent provided six things that they did not agree with the appraiser. The agent was actually wrong on five of the things that they provided, but the square footage adjustments they were actually correct on. So when I called the appraiser, she said, well, you're just taking uh, his side because he's a top producing agent. And I knew nothing about the agent. When I go into these conversations, I don't ask how many transactions does this agent do? I look at the facts. My job is to take all the emotion out of this and deal strictly with the facts. So if you are gonna reach out to appraiser, because a lot of times you are gonna have their information, they call your office to schedule, and get it set up. If it's going to escalate or you feel like it's going to escalate, I would say reach out to your team and, and let them handle that conversation. Because at the end of the day, a lot of us, especially if we've in sales or egos are, are things that we, we sometimes carry around and, and, and we don't like to have them hurt. If you are feeling like what I'm not going to be able to have a conversation with this person. I'm going to lose my mind on them because this is just absurd. Then I would probably say reach out to your team. Let them either handle it or they'll reach out to myself or my team and we'll have that conversation with the appraiser. So you're saying the appraisers don't want the phone call from the realtor to tell them how to do their job. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> That's exactly because yeah. in that same scenario, the lady was like, it's like, I ended up in the middle of it because the appraiser's like, oh, if she thought the value was 300, then why did she list it for 275? And I'm like, 
because that's the world we're living in. There's this thing that has, has created where agents can list the home sell for lower than what they expect to sell it for. It creates a buzz. It gets multiple offers. It puts people. It, it, it's it's a strategy. Well, I don't know. I just if she's so good at her job, he's so good at his job. I don't understand why he didn't know the value was three hundred thousand. It's so it, it just creates some back and forth that's not necessary. But we're happy to take that that call off I'll, your off your hands. I'll finish with this last one that I'd love to hear and your opinion on it. This appraiser is not from Roswell. I don't know why you're sending out an appraisal from Gwinnett County into Roswell or they live in Athens. They don't know this area. And my response is, it doesn't matter where you're from. The comps are the comps. Okay. You can live in Arizona and do the appraisal in Georgia if you got the pictures, right? The comps are the comps and that's where we're getting it from. You don't have to be from this neighborhood to know the value of the home. If the comps aren't there, it's all about the data, guys. We get it. We get agents saying, why is this? A, the appraisal came in low. They don't know this area. They don't know. They're from two states yeah. down. I'm like, it doesn't matter. And then we you always know, follow that just, up with just, we always follow it up with, then just give me the comps that I can go back to them with. And then they don't have comps. And so, they don't have, if you do have so, comps, by all means, we're going to go back. Sure. Or, I've got a few where we do have a, a few scenarios that we've had to take appraisers out of certain counties because now this is more in like the Alabama, Mississippi area because they've got old school and you guys may have this in Georgia too, but they've got some old school MLS systems. Whereas if you don't belong to our board, we're not giving you our information. So sometimes appraisers won't belong to to the MLS, um, you know, the, the a city or a town will use two MLSs, it, it could, it, two possible MLS systems. And, and the appraisers who are from there or know that market really well will sign up and have access to both. And mm-hmm. sometimes if you're coming from outside of that, so we've actually had that a, a couple of times and we've had to remove appraisers that we go in behind them. We don't tell them we're removing them. We go in behind them. We take those counties off their list so they don't get assigned to them. So we don't take them off our list completely. We just, if they tell me they don't have access to, the, to, to an MLS, then I take them off of that county and just leave them in the counties that they have full access to. But that does happen. But most of the time you're right. It's It doesn't matter where you're from as long as you're utilizing the data that's available. Awesome. It's 10 after now. We're a little late. Thank you everyone for joining us. We will send every single person the short PowerPoint we had and the recording. But again, if you got follow-up questions, reach out to your loan officer, reach out to me. Uh, we'll get you those questions uh, answered. Next month, we're doing the same style, more of a Q&A. We're bringing an insurance agent in. We're having an insurance conversation. What's going on in the state of Florida? That's important. And how insurance premiums, why they're getting so expensive. Um, feel free to join us. We'll have an insurance agent where you can ask questions just like Eugene. Thank you very much. Have a great October. And uh, thanks for joining us. Have a great thanks, day, guys. guys. Have a great one. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you Gino.